When you start your day in reactive mode, the whole thing just goes down the toilet and it goes down really fast. And then you're just catching up and you never, you never feel like you got enough done. You never really feel productive. And it's like 5.45 in the afternoon. You're like, what did I even do today? And, and that, if you fix that, then all of, all of the dominating and business stuff becomes much easier to do. Because here's the good news. Most of your competitors are addicted to their cell phone, addicted to social media, addicted to meaningless activity, addicted to $10 an hour work. They're ignoring the $1,000 an hour work. And if you have your head straight and your life and your brain is not run by other people, it's amazing what you can produce. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you've heard me and Josh talk about MWI, which is our digital marketing agency. If you're new around here, this may be a first introduction to MWI. We're a full service digital marketing agency that specializes in everything from website design and development to search engine optimization and all forms of paid advertising, whether it's paid social advertising or paid search advertising, content marketing, digital PR, social media management, basically anything a business needs to strengthen and grow their digital footprint is what we do over at MWI. The website is mwi.com. And for any listeners of the Hope Strategy Podcast, I'd love to offer a free 20 minute consultation with yours truly to talk about your business, to talk about your goals, to understand you know, what you need to be doing from a digital marketing strategy and action plan standpoint in order to yield some results and grow your business online. So please reach out at mwi.com forward slash hope strategy. That's mwi.com forward slash hope strategy to sign up and we will be in touch. Now back to the show. Welcome to a new episode of the Hope Strategy Podcast. We had the privilege today to get a little over an hour of Perry Marshall's time. We had a fantastic conversation with him. Perry is one of the most successful business strategists in the world. He is endorsed in Forbes and Inc. Magazine. He's guided clients like FanDuel and Infusionsoft from startup to hundreds of millions of dollars. He founded the $10 million Evolution 2.0 Prize, which judges from Harvard, Oxford, and MIT. It launched at the Royal Society in London. It's the world's largest research award. Um, he is the author of a number of books, which we spoke about uh, earlier uh, in his career. I guess the first one was an audio book, Guerrilla Marketing for High-Tech Salespeople. And then in the early days of digital marketing, he wrote the book, The Definitive Guide to uh, Google AdWords. And then he wrote another book, The Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords. And then most, well, he wrote a really successful book that's really know, well known in the sales and marketing space called The 80-20 Sales and Marketing, The Definitive Guide to Working Less and Making More. And then most recently, uh, the book Detox, Declutter, Dominate, How to Excel by Elimination. It was, it was a really cool conversation because we talked about his life experiences and his journey, just like we do with everybody, but then specifically tied that into how it affected his entrepreneurial journey and then how it affected his thought leadership journey as he's written a lot of books and really built a career on, um, you know, really valuable, sharing really valuable information and content that's led to incredible opportunities for him. How do you know him? How did you hear about him initially? Did you read his book, the 80-20 book? Is that how you first found him? Yeah. So my friend Jess Larson recommended his book, 8020 Sales and Marketing. And I read that and it just blew me away. I really liked the uh, concept of th there's 80%, but there's 80% within the 80%. Because he talks about like, if, you've, if you're marketing to a group, you might market to a group and everybody in this group is willing to spend 10 bucks. But out of that group, 80% of those people are willing to spend a hundred bucks and 80% of those people are willing to spend a thousand dollars and 80% of those people are willing to spend $5,000 and so on and so on. And I really, that's what really caught my attention was just that idea that if, well, gee, why don't I just go for that 1% of the whole or whatever that is generating 99% of the revenue I should just go straight to that. And that was just kind of a mind opening concept for me. Yeah, the concept is true and it is proven by numbers and data and science and all of that. Obviously, getting to that point is 
a lot more difficult is finding those people and getting to them, but, but it is definitely possible. And we've seen that in our own business. Um, I, I love the, the arc of this conversation because he was an engineer uh, that finished school in the mid nineties, got a job in the mid nineties as an engineer. And then really his career has spanned the entire length of the, the time that the internet's been relevant. And so he's seen Google and he's seen these things blow up and the, the growth. And then it ends with this book, Detox, Declutter, Dominate, where we talked about healthy living and health management of time in a way that you're not you know addicted to technology and phone and, and kind of walk through his processes and his systems for how he overcomes some of what we have as, um, a, you know, addictive tendencies with social media or with phones or devices or whatever, and how he implements a lot of this 80, 20 rule and other, um, research that he's done in this book is really fascinating. So again, a lot of talk about entrepreneurship, but also a ton of talk about, um, self-awareness and living with intention and time management and how to maximize your day and how to live a meaningful life. And, um, hearing his story with some really good uh, context, uh, really, really was a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. So please uh, listen and enjoy this conversation with Perry Marshall. Something is happening in our world. Time is very precious. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hope in the face of difficulty. More than machinery, we need humanity. Hope in the face of uncertainty. I'm better now than I was I'm experienced now. Changing the world can happen anywhere and anyone can do it. The audacity of hope. This is the Hope Strategy Podcast with Corey Blake and Josh Steinle. I'm Corey. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. It's a a pleasure. It's nice to meet you face to face, Perry. Yeah, uh, it is. Um, So, uh, and where are you, Josh, physically? I'm in Boston now. I think we're actually, I was probably in Boston the last time we talked, but uh, I know I was in Asia when I first read your book, because I actually remember where I was on a street in Shenzhen, China, when I read that part of your book about the $10 tasks and the $100 and $1,000 and all that stuff. And I, it's funny, I know exactly where I was. I could go find the spot. Wow. Because I read that and I was like, Wow, I'm doing a lot of ten dollar tasks. What am I doing? <laughs> I'm guessing that very shortly after he read that, I received a WhatsApp message like, "Hey, you need to read this book. Hey, have you heard about <laughs> probably?" <laughs> All right, well, go, go Shenzhen, right? Awesome. I'm based out in Phoenix, so just outside of Phoenix in Gilbert, Arizona. Where are you at, Perry? I'm in Chicago with two feet of snow. Okay, I think Josh has got a lot of snow too, right? We got snow, but it's actually sunny today, and it's like. 33 degrees. Like it's pretty nice outside compared to the negative 20 they've got in Texas, which is just bizarre. Totally. In order to understand where people create their life's purpose and where they make their meaning and how they ended up to where they are, we like to kind of, you know, backstep a little bit. Your, your journey is an interesting one to me where it was, I want to learn a little bit about your upbringing because you went to school to be an engineer and mm-hmm. then things pivoted and changed and you ended up obviously becoming a very successful entre- marketer and entrepreneur and thought leader and all this stuff. But can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and maybe some of the foundational things that you learned as a kid that helped you get to you know, those first steps of being an engineer? And then from there on, we'll, we'll talk about But what, 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 was, what was your upbringing like? Well, so I was a pastor's kid. So and my, my mom stayed at home and she... Uh, took care of the kids and stuff. So super conservative, Lincoln, Nebraska, Midwestern, very tight knit religious community. And, um, and so I, well, I was super interested in electronics starting at about age nine. I, I was supposed to like write a school report or something. And I, I did it on Thomas Edison. And I just like, I went down the electricity rabbit hole and Mm. I'm still in it, uh, 40 years later. And, (laughs) um, and then in, in, um, in middle school, I started building stereo equipment and in high school, it was mostly my only job. Um, I had this little tiny business and I was running classified ads in newspaper and selling speakers. And then when I was a senior in high school, I started selling them in a at a dealership uh, next to other brands like B 
B and B and W and Denon and you know brands like that. And um, so you were and, making uh, these. You were buying the parts for these speakers and making these speakers and selling them. Yes. Yes. What kind of speakers were they? Um, well, the ones I sold at Sound Dimensions were uh, they were about. 30 inches tall and uh, they had oak on the top and bottom and eight, eight inch two way speaker. I, I think it was actually a pretty clever design, especially for what I did and did not know how to do at the time. Yeah. And you uh, have some uh, experience in your younger years, Corey was selling speakers or I something. Did, yeah. In high school, one of my, uh, uh, well, one of my brothers in law, brothers in laws, I can say that he bought, he would buy speakers wholesale from a, a place where I lived. And then my job was to go pick up in my dad's truck, all the speaker, the subwoofers and the amps and everything, and then go ship all of them. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> it was heavy lifting. It was hard work, but I, I'd get a cut of ever, I'd get a cut of every one of those that we shipped out. So yeah, I, I've, I've got some background. I wasn't the guy building the speakers. I was the, on the other end, the guy delivering the speakers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my dad died of cancer and probably a month before he died, I went to his hospital room. Dad, um, I, I just got a, a deal to sell my speakers in a store. He was like, and then I, I went, I went back, I don't know, later that evening and a bunch of his friends were there and everybody knew about it. Yeah. He was, he was, he was proud of me. And, and there's, that's kind of an important story because a couple of years before, he had been really nervous that I was just growing up to be a lazy bum. And, and in fact, he kind of twisted my arm until I got a janitorial job. Uh, and I kind of proved to him that working a janitor job, that I wasn't actually a lazy bum. And then I quit that job to do the stereo equipment business um, as my exclusive form of income. So I guess you could say that that was my my first Delbert Cube Escape. It was a super micro Delbert Cube Escape from a, a job that made three and a half bucks an hour sweeping floors, um, and uh, and so yeah, I mean that that was those were exciting times. They were also uh, stressful times because there was a lot of turmoil going on. Um, but I, I was so curious about how it all worked and what made it work. Like I knew I was. I was exquisitely clear on the fact that I could look up formulas in a book and I could, you know, look at something on a chart and I could sort of piece together how to make something work, but I didn't truly know how it worked and I couldn't truly predict what was going to happen. Uh, and that's why I went and got an engineering degree. It was like, well, if I, if I learn all that stuff, I'll actually know like what uh, I'll know how, how it works from the ground up. And um, that turned out to be a very important thing because like today, I, I talk to people all the time and I write in my books about going to the bottom of the swamp. Like I, I tell the Beowulf story, which I, I don't know that we need to get into right now, but, but just the idea of, you know, when you are doing something, are you just sort of floating around on the surface or are you actually touching the bottom of the lake, of the swamp, of the swimming pool? Do, do you know the difference between the, you know, the wavy world of the water that you're floating around in? Or are you actually anchored to something? And that's just been a recurring theme in pretty much everything I've ever done. So, um, so yeah, like, uh, I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything. They, they were a huge, huge part of... And, and this doesn't come up very much when I do interviews and podcasts and things like this. It, it kind of gets skipped over because it's, it's too little league. Well, one of the thing, one of the things I've always said, so I studied in school, anthrop anthropology and communications, international culture studies, and grew up moving around all over the world. My dad was in the military and I love the human side of the joke is when I, when I was early married and I was in college, I was doing door to door sales. And I'd come home and my, my wife would say, Hey, how'd the day go? Expecting me to tell her how many sales I got. And I would tell her about this woman that I spoke with that had this experience with her husband the day before that changed their life. You know what I mean? And she'd be like, right. Oh, I was wondering how many sales, <laughs> you know, but so <laughs> I, I am fascinated with where people kind of make their meaning. And so, so one of the things it's kind of interesting, just a little, this, this happens all, we've talked to so many successful entrepreneurs, successful 
CEOs and, and that when they were younger and they had a knack for that, their parents were worried. And a lot of the same kind of generation, 40s, 50s, 60s, where the parents were like, well, hold on now, go be a janitor because that's secure and that's safe. And now me, I've got four kids. Josh has three kids. Like we're, the, the generation has changed, right? We're, we're actively like, if my kid comes and says, Hey, I've got this thing and I want to sell it. And I want to, it's like entrepreneurship is just a big deal. It's like well-known and talked about when I was a kid, I didn't know what entrepreneurship even meant. You know, my nine-year-old is very well aware of what that is. Oh, it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting that your, that your dad is like, Oh man, what a, you know, what's this kid going to turn out to be? Go be a janitor. And it's like, well, Hey, I'm building stuff and I'm selling it. You know, I love that. And that's so meaningful that just shortly before he passed, you were able to have that confirmation of, of, uh, pride, you know, that he, he saw you for what you were doing and was proud of it. Yeah, that was a big deal. Uh, in fact, I think when you're an adult, you start to figure out a lot more that that was a big deal than you realized at the yeah. time. Right. Cause, cause some people, they go through their whole life and they got a chip on their shoulder. Their dad never approved of them. They're always trying to prove something. And I, I think I, I escaped that and that's a gift. Yeah. That is a, that is a huge gift. And yeah, that's, that's amazing. So, so you go on and you, you eventually get your engineering degree and then you lost that job at some point, right? So I, I think there was, you got laid off or something and that kind of obviously changed the complete course. So what was that experience? Like, what were you doing and what was it like to be in that vulnerable situation where it was like, Oh, I, you can just tell me I'm not, I don't have a job anymore. I mean, I'm guessing that impacted you quite a bit. Well, my, my wife was three months pregnant. I got called into this meeting and it was the weirdest meeting I'd ever seen because there wasn't any rhyme or reason to. So like there's somebody from the shipping department and there's somebody from the warehouse. <laughs> Your spidey <laughs> sense was tingling a little bit like this doesn't seem. Right. <laughs> yeah. My spidey sense was definitely going up. And, and Herman, the guy who, who, who's running the division is like, you know, he's kind of breathing hard and he's looking stressed out. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I know sales have been slow this summer, so we're probably, this is probably not going to be a fun meeting. And so everybody got laid off. And, and uh, I, on the way out the door, I, I told him, I said, look, it's not like the day that I was born that somebody else was born with a responsibility to give me a job. So thanks for letting me work here for the last three years. And, you know, sayonara. And yeah. I, and, and I, I took my check and, and I left. What year was this? This was 95. Okay. And, um, and uh, so, well, I quickly became a parent that if I was going to stay in engineering, I was probably going to have to move out of Chicago. Uh, and so I, I didn't want to do that. Did you go to school in Chicago? How did Chicago become your new hub from Nebraska? That's where the speaker job was. I, I took a job designing speakers. I, oh, oh I, okay. I designed speakers for the Ford Probe and the Acura Vigor and the Jeep Cherokee and the Honda Civic back then. And oh, I'm glad like, you touched on that. So you actually took this this small on this this first entrepreneurial endeavor as a kid, and you went when you got your engineering degree. That's what you were actually doing is building speakers. Well, I was, I was working at Jensen, which was a huge OEM yeah. okay. that, that supplied the automakers. So I was the lead acoustical engineer on, I don't know, three, four, five models. Oh, wow. Like That's the awesome. Honda Civic. And, and so I enjoyed that job, but uh, all of a sudden I get laid off and the only acoustics jobs are like in Indiana or some other place. And and I didn't want to move. It was like I had moved three years ago and I didn't want to move again. And I liked Chicago. Um, and not only is like, well, and if not only that, if I stayed in engineering, I probably wouldn't make enough money for my wife to be a full time mom. And so I sort of took a double leap. It was like, well, I'm going to go into sales because in theory, I can make more money in sales. Um, and I'm going to actually try to make enough money, uh, that we can do one income. And so I did both of those at the same time. And that was very stressful because that sales job didn't really work out all that well for two Yeah, years. No pressure when your wife's three months pregnant. Was that your first, I assume? Yeah. First. So yeah, that's a big, uh, that's a yeah. pivotal moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and really one, one thing that I see 
uh, about most successful people is they make commitments and then they figure out how to make them work. Like mm. they do not have it all figured out in advance. And in fact, a lot of times they force themselves into situations that will require them to make it work one way or another or another or another. Um, and that's really where their capabilities come from. One of my early mentors when I was uh, in my early or I guess late teens, early 20s, told me that he would always talk about making and keeping commitments. And the way that he put it is he said, real, he said, true power comes from making and keeping commitments mm -hmm. and power in this, you know, that can have a negative connotation to it sometimes. But what he, what he was saying was if you plan to build a, a career of any sort, build relationships and any sort, anything that you, you know, are going to be able to pull power out of, you know, in order to continue to get better and to be continue to improve, you have to be somebody that makes and keeps commitments because the second you make a commitment that you go back on or you don't show up to pick up that person that you told them you'd be there. That's the last time they ask you to do something. Right. And as you make right. those commitments and keep them, then new opportunities present themselves. And that's something I've preached at our company for a long time. I tell my kids that just this week, my, my son was trying to buy a hamster. That was his big thing is I wanted to, he wanted to buy a hamster. He's been saving up his money and he had made a commitment to his grandpa who was going to buy a comic book that he had written to give it to him that day in order to get them. Anyways, he's like, well, he already told me to give me the money, so I'll just do it tomorrow. And I said, no, you made a commitment to have that to him by six o'clock today. You've got to keep that. Otherwise, he's not going to trust you the next time, you know, so critical. Yeah. I mean, that's and again, in successful people, that is a very common trait because as you make and keep those commitments, you truly gain knowledge and wisdom and power that you can take on to the next thing. Those are the people in the world who meet payroll. Which yeah. People who make payroll make the world go round, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And those that started not making and keeping commitments earlier are the ones that you're like, wait, where's my paycheck? And they're flaking out and they're telling you every every story they can of when your paycheck's coming and it's not. So beware of working for the for those individuals. <laughs> in in today's world, and, and any entrepreneurs that listen to our podcast, they know this. We're we're kind of inundated constantly with these thought leaders and these books and podcasts and shows and you know the and and it seems to me that you were on to this very early, this idea of, look, I've, I've acquired some skills that are valuable and I am going to create content that is going to be able to deliver my processes and, and what I've learned to the masses. In fact, in 2002, is that, was that your first, was it the, the Gorilla Marketing for High Tech Sales People? It was like an audio book, a CD, right, that you released. Was yes. that the first foray into this type of content? Well, pretty much, yes. So, um, so what happened was I struggled in that sales job for two years and I eventually got fired. But before I got fired, I wandered into a Coliseum and heard Dan Kennedy, who levitated 300 bucks out of my wallet. And I bought, and th that was in 97. Okay. Levitated and, 300 bucks. I like, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> well, you know, I, this, I was a guy who's used to buying Amway tapes for six bucks. Right. Um, which they were worth what they cost, which was like not a lot. And, yeah. um, and, uh, and, and so Dan was selling this ancient version of, of, of magnetic marketing. And, and like, I was so desperate and, um, and I started studying this stuff and what it was saying was you can replace cold calling with direct marketing. You can replace branding with direct response and copywriting and stuff. And, uh, and I got really intrigued by this. I get fired from my job and I take another job and they had a website and they sold industrial equipment and, um, most companies didn't have a website in 1997. And I'm reading these Dan Kennedy newsletters, which at the time were barely talking about the internet at all. Um, and I was like, hey, wait a minute. You know, like a letter in the mail and a web page are like kind of the same thing. And I like, I think like yeah. I started connecting dots. I was like, I'm just gonna use this. Dan Kennedy direct marketing stuff on, on the, the company website. And we're, so we're, we're generating leads. We're, we're using lead generation magnets. We're doing SEO and that worked. And we grew that business considerably 
and it got sold to a public company and I got some stock options. And, and I was like, hmm, you know, I'm kind of good at marketing now. What if I actually got really good at this? What could I do then? And, and so I was, I was following Dan Kennedy assiduously and, and I was becoming aware there's this whole little cottage industry called information marketing. And I think I kind of like the, the looks of that. And so what, so I left that company when it got sold and I hung out my shingle and I was basically a marketing consultant for industrial and B2B companies. And, and I needed to generate leads. So I made a CD called guerrilla marketing for high tech salespeople. It was just a CD or was it a book? Was it a paperback or something you as well? Get, you could get a CD or a printed version. It was a little booklet. Uh, and it was very good. I mean, I'm still kind of buy it, right? Uh, well, it's yeah. I think yes. Yeah, like, I think we sell it for five dollars on my website. It's still good. Like, it's good stuff. And 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 I, um, so I started generating leads, and with that, and eventually started uh, selling info products. And you know, this was really during the dot com crash. And the, it was like the, the glamour of the internet had sort of got rusty because all of these companies had wiped out, but it turned out that was actually the golden age of internet marketing right there. It was so that's like late night, like very late nineties, early two thousands, right? 2001, two. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and like that was when the real stuff was happening because Google ads came out in the spring of 2002. And, and most people didn't know what Google was. Google yeah. was this weird little company with a white search engine instead of having all that weird stuff all over the place. And I loved Google. I thought like, man, like I like the way these guys do things because I was an engineer and they were engineers. And when their AdWords program came out, it took me about three days to figure out this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like, this so, is I was, so I was going to, so this leads into a question I had. So in 2011 or something, I was a college student and that's when Josh and I started talking about working together on some other stuff. And then, but, but it was really the first time that I started to pull back the curtain of this world of digital entrepreneurship. Like, like you don't, you don't learn about that stuff in grade school. I didn't learn about it in high school. And I, this is, I mean, I graduated high school in 2005. So, you know, the internet was still new ish, but it was on its way, but we didn't talk about this stuff. Anyways, I remember, and I guess it's different now, right? Kids are, it's, it's different now, but, but when do you remember that? So it sounds like that job where you had a website for the first time is when you kind of pulled back that curtain of like the whole, the realm of possibilities that the internet provided for entrepreneurship, business sales, marketing. What was that? I mean, how did that just kind of change your view on the world? So I would say there was two steps with that. The first step was I'm generating leads on the internet. I'm making money. Not, we didn't have e-commerce and we weren't taking orders online but a whole bunch of our business came from the website. And so it's like, so I am way ahead of the pack in making a living on the internet. Like most people that were talking about making money on the internet were just like selling money about making money on the internet. I this was, was still, this was still a time when it was like, is the internet going to last? Right. There was like yeah. the question of like, is this going to stick around for the long haul or is this like a fad? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Hundreds okay. of people doing what you were doing, maybe thousands, but not like there are today millions upon millions upon millions of marketers out there that know this stuff. But in that, oh. in that, in those days, you and Josh were two of the only ones. <laughs> right. So it was, it was that early bleeding edge phase. And then there was the run up of the dot coms. And then there was the dot com crash. Okay. So that's like, I would call that phase one, phase two. When you said peeling back the curtain, here's mm -hmm. when to me the curtain really got peeled back. It was when I went to Ken Carthy's system seminar in spring of 2002, right at the same time Google started selling ads. And John Keel gave a presentation on keyword research. And Overture Yahoo had a, a keyword tool. And you could type in and find out how many searches there were on plumber or, you know, or typing lessons or like whatever the keyword was. And it was like, 
that to me, that was like, oh my goodness, I just saw the other side of the curtain. There's a whole other view. There's the search engine's point of view, not the person looking at the search engine. And then if the whole English language is for sale and I can put my ad up there, oh my goodness, like we are in a whole new world. And, and it was true. And, and so like, I remember a few months later, I went to visit my brother in China and I showed him this and I said, dude, like, this is the future. Like, this is the whole next wave. In fact, I said, you know, right now, Microsoft is in charge of the world. Fast forward 10 years, I said, Google is going to be in charge of the world. And I was right. I didn't even know how right I was. Um, I just could vaguely see that. In fact, he said, oh, it's like that Who song. Here comes the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, you know, won't be fooled again. Uh, so, yeah, I, like I could see that that this was big. But what here's what I didn't realize. I didn't realize how monopolistic the Internet could become because I thought what I thought would happen would be, well, I don't know, maybe it's Google this year, but then it'll be somebody else next year. There'll be somebody else next year. I didn't realize the network effects that would just keep these big things growing and growing and growing bigger and bigger. I remember Overture, that was a great tool. And I remember using that for keyword research and just thinking, this is amazing. I mean, they had such great data. It's funny when you think about how they missed the boat though. I mean, they <laughs> had that tool really? and then Google ate them up and Yahoo just, unfortunately Yahoo missed the boat so many times. It was totally their own fault. They didn't have a clue as to what they were. I don't know who was in charge. I don't know what they were thinking, but they completely biffed it and it was theirs to lose. Because and that's they, without even going into the time that Google offered themselves to Yahoo for a million bucks and Yahoo passed. Right. Oh my gosh. Right. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, yeah, Yahoo is just a pale shadow of what, what they could have been. So unless you go to Japan, Yahoo's thriving. <laughs> it's the one place I've been that I was like, oh, Yahoo's everywhere. So I didn't realize that. So early on, Google offered themselves to sell to Yahoo for a million dollars. Google offered their search technology to Yahoo. Oh, my God. Million in 1998 or nine or something. Oh, my goodness. Now they'd have to sell it for trillions of dollars. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Talk about missing the boat. So. What, do you remember that that's huge that that i mean what a great like what a great um what's the word i'm looking for all of these different moments in time and where you were in your career i mean just a very serendipitous couple of years there where it was like oh i have the privilege i'm the right age I've, i'm the right point in my career to see this and recognize the opportunity ahead and to and and it is interesting to say search is the future mm -hmm. um but I, you had no idea Google would become what it what it would become. We actually interviewed a couple of weeks ago, um, Kara Golden. She's the CEO of Hint, the founder and CEO of Hint Water. But she told a really cool story on that episode about when she was working for AOL in the early, like the, what was it, Josh? I think it was early 2000s, right? Early 2000s, she was working for AOL and, and they were trying to figure out how to sell books online. And so she had heard about this guy up in Seattle that was doing something along the lines of selling books online. So she scheduled a meeting with Jeff Bezos and went and showed up a little bit late. And he said, you showed up late. We're not going to meet anymore. I don't have time. I'm, I'm building. He literally was building bookshelves in a, in like a warehouse. He was building bookshelves in order to store books that they were going to sell. Wow. So she ended up going in and convincing her way in say, I'm sorry, I'm late, but let's talk. I can help you build shelves. So she had this real, this conversation with Jeff Bezos I think she said it was like 2000. I can't remember. I'm trying to remember the whole timeline here. But anyways, he he told her, she said, why do you think, why is why would people not go to Barnes and Noble? Like, what do you think? Like, people aren't just going to buy their books online. There's stores that do that. And he explained to her in that moment, you know, he, he asked her, he said, how often when you're in Barnes and Noble, do you go ask for advice on what books to buy? And she said, well, not very often because I know what I like and I don't trust the 19-year-old kid or whatever that's working there. And he said, that's it. Search is the future of buying books and, and recommendations is the future. And there's ways that a computer can... And she she said in that moment, her 
mind was blown and horizons were like opened up to her that she had never fathomed of like, oh my gosh, the capabilities of this thing that we call the internet were opened up to her for the first time, you know? And so it's, it's really fascinating entrepreneurs of a certain era where you can hear these stories of like, I, and then I saw it, you know, I saw what was to come mm -hmm. and uh, obviously, holy cow, how far has it come for better or for worse? <laughs> there's, right. there's been a lot of transitions since then. So, so the story continues though, where you, you said, so you had this book, the guerrilla marketing for high-tech salespeople. And then you discover Google AdWords, you start to be, you become proficient at it and you realize there's an opportunity again for thought leadership here. So then you wrote, was the first one, was it the ultimate guide to Google AdWords or was it the definitive guide to Google AdWords? Well, definitive was the original. And yeah. then the next year you came out the second one. And so that obviously took off and was huge because you have all of these business people all over trying to understand and fathom how, how this AdWords stuff works, which to this day, a lot of people still don't understand. So talk, me to, talk to me about that transition and how, you, how that book opened up new doors for you, new opportunities for you as you continue down the journey of entrepreneurship. I spent a year generating leads. Like I was trying to give away my CD. So I'm buying Google ads, dropping people on a landing page, sending out a CD, mailing it out, and, um, you know, building this information business. And a year later, Ken McCarthy, whose, whose seminar I had gone to and discovered Overture, um, I was talking to him and I go, Ken, you don't start with Overture. You start with Google. And I give him a bunch of reasons why. And he goes, oh, well, who should I get to speak at my seminar? And I gave him a name. And he goes and talks to the guy because he already had a book. and. He turned him down and Ken comes back to me and says, I think you should speak at my seminar in Google ads. And I'm like, oh, well, I actually know what that entails. Because that means that like, I got to have a book, I got to have a platform, I got to have a product to sell. Uh, I got to be at like, they're not going to pay me to speak. So, okay. So I put all that stuff together and I went to a seminar and I, gave a talk on Google ads and I explained how it all worked and, and the audience was very responsive and I picked up some clients and, and I got a bunch of great testimonials within a few weeks because like this thing was just exploding. Well, um, that was just like immediately before the Google affiliate gold rush just avalanched through the world uh, because people suddenly figured out, oh, the whole English language is for sale and there's about 5,000 affiliate programs I could go sign up for and figure out how to sell something. So I'm going to arbitrage, I'm going to bid on a keyword, send it to an affiliate program, collect the commissions. And that's really hard to do now, but back then it was pretty easy because the bid prices were so cheap. And so the people that were doing that figured out Perry's book is the best book to actually explain Google's system and how to use it. And so this just turned into a tsunami. Um, and literally within six months, I was famous in the whole internet marketing world. And, um, and so I'm speaking at seminars and I'm getting invited on webinars and I, everybody's buying my book and all this stuff was going on. Um, and man, it was like a magic carpet ride. In fact, it, it was kind of bewildering because it, it was, it was a bit much. I mean, yeah. it, it wasn't like being Tom Hanks or anything. I mean, don't get me wrong, but like, man, it was weird. Um, you know, I go to a seminar and like all these people know who I am and I've never met them before. Like that's, that's just weird. Yeah, it's a weird transition, especially <laughs> coming from what you were coming from. It's not like that was something you had been really aiming for, even it sounds like. It was just kind of like an opportunity presented itself, and I can provide some value, and it'll turn into a speaking engagement, which turned into a lot of speaking engagements and a lot of people buying your book. Right. But again, it sounds like you sh struck at the perfect time right before, like you said, this Google affiliate and like this digit, this e-commerce world started to develop, you know, and people relied heavily on. Yes. The tools that you understood that not very many people did, which is, which is awesome. Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm very, very thankful for that. And I'm also, I, I mean, I have to say I was a very, uh, diligent student of marketing. I was 
sucking in everything I could absorb from anywhere. Uh, and I was reading voraciously. And, and so it was like when the touchdown pass got thrown to me, I was ready. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned this earlier. I was at the right part, moment in my career because I was at a transitional space where I had like my, my schedule was not jammed with commitments. Yeah. So I actually had time to explore. And I think that is a huge thing that is great. Like most people, what they try to do is they're like, okay, my job is to just get as busy as I can and then just keep the squirrel cage turning. And then like, and then I'll feed the family. And then not only that, like they get too expensive of a car, too expensive of a house, and then they can't get out of it. I think one of the most important things that you ever have, not just early in your career, but during your career is space and time to explore and the margin to not have some crushing pressure where you always have to, you know, deliver, 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 pay the piper. Uh, That's, that's really important too. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had space. Yeah. So later, so later on, I think it was 2011, you wrote the book, um, 80, 20 sales and marketing, the definitive guide to working less and making more. You had obviously heard about this 80, 20 principle and this 80, 20 rule. I'm going to guess, and I may be wrong, I'll project this onto you and maybe I'm wrong, but in this, in this kind of growth curve that you had seen this big, did you get to a place where you had, you didn't have great work-life balance. And so it, so you started to seek out, you know, new methods for managing that better because now you've gone from being a, a, a thought leader on marketing to marketing sales and now also time management and building building wealth with less time and kind of you know the, the the ideas here there's a lot of overlap so how did how did you get to that place where you said this is something that you know I, I need to continue to learn more about and continue to spread the word on well just like a month or two before um I got the invitation to speak at the seminar, probably two months, I read Richard Kosh's book, The 80-20 Principle. And it set my mind on fire because- Tell everybody what the 80-20 Principle is simply. I know this is where we get to the part where you talk about stuff you always talk about. So we'll, (laughs) but but the high level quick, what is the 80-20 Principle? Okay, so the high level is, most people have probably heard somewhere that 80% 80% of the people own 20% of the land and the real estate and the buildings and the wealth and 20% of the people own 80% of all the stuff. Um, and it's kind of usually this vague economic theory. And maybe you've also heard that uh, 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. Well, it turns out it's true of almost everything. Um, almost everything in business that you can measure in a whole ton of things, not in business, the size of craters on the moon or the amount of water flowing through the rivers. It's all 80 to 20. Okay. Not only that, and this was, this was the big epiphany was there's an 80, 20 inside every 80, 20. So if 20% of the roads carry 80% of the traffic, 20% 20% of 20% of the roads carry 80% of 80% of the traffic and 20% of 20% of the customers generate 80% of 80% of the sales. And I was like, Whoa. And like my brain just melted. Well, that was, like I said, that was a, just a few months before I got pulled into the, Oh, you know, you're writing books about, you know, uh, Google ads and, and, and stuff like that. Well, what I quickly figured out was that everything that makes a Google account work or not work is because of 80, 20. And in fact, everything in marketing that works, usually the easiest way to explain why it works is 80, 20. And so my, my, my original Google book, it, it did have a little section about 80 20 somewhere in the middle of it. But what it really was, it was the 80 20 way of figuring out where the levers are in a Google ad campaign. Okay, just the 20%, just the 5%, just the 1%. 
and and it, it worked and 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 it really helped people and they understood it and the book went supernova. Um, a, well, several years later, I I had some frustrations with Google. It was great being the king of Google. But the problem with Google was Google would just assassinate thousands of customers at will, like like with just a change any, of the algorithm. You mean any time they wanted? Well. They would ban people. It wasn't algorithm changes. It was policy changes. Mm -hmm. They're like, um, oh, we are banning all affiliate marketing, carte blanche. And they did it. Like um, in 2005, they just machine gunned like 100,000 affiliate marketers overnight. So this is where some of that maybe some of that uh, dominion was happening that was not really on on uh, stage for the whole world to see. Now we're starting to see that more. And there's obviously a lot of conversations around that type of oh, yes, censorship. Right. But, back, but they were doing it a long time before, okay. just with less well-known topics. They've been doing this for 16 years. They've been doing it. Look, on a bad day, Google is the boyfriend who rapes the girlfriend and throws them down the stairwell at the Holiday Inn. Okay. They... <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, they don't give a shit about their customers. Um, they, okay, some of them they do, but dude, you're a number and, and you're playing against the casino. You said um, that was on a bad day or on a good day? Well, on a bad day. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, on a good day, like, they're geez, okay. <laughs> and and you, you, uh, look, you got to give them credit. The Google search engine has made millions of businesses possible that would not even be possible okay and like to play devil's advocate they do have to police the thing they can't just let they they can't just do total free speech laissez-faire capitalism there it's impossible to run a platform like that without some rules okay and you know i most of them most of the people there they're they're trying to do the best they can but let's not like, let's not make have any question. Like, a year and a half ago, they completely nuked alternative medicine on the free side and the paid side. They completely nuked IRS negotiators. Why they would do that? I, I don't know. They must be in the back pocket of somebody in the government. I don't know. Okay. Um, they... Uh, do, there's okay there's all of this you know there's there's that movie what is it called the social network or whatever where they're criticizing facebook for yeah. oh, for selling everybody out L listen what advertisers are doing is benign all advertisers actually care about is they don't want ads to show to people that aren't going to buy that's really all any advertiser cares about they don't care about your personal information they don't care about your social security number. They don't care about that. They just want to sell you something. Here's the real problem. The real problem is all of these platforms can tilt the scales in favor of ideologies however they want, and they do. Let's, let's be realistic about this. Um, getting deplatformed or getting censored is not new. It's been happening for a yeah. really long time in every decade, every century, every, there's always people who are in charge of the megaphone and there's all these people that are speaking through somebody else's meg megaphone. And what all smart marketers have to do is they have to build multiple communication channels, some of which you actually own. Okay. So like, there's no real censorship of podcasting, okay? You might get banned from iTunes, but you can be on the other feeds, okay? Um, email is fairly, you know, yeah, fairly reliable. Direct mail is 100% reliable. Um, you can have webinars. You can have Zooms if you get text, you know, text messages uh, and, and customer phone numbers, but like you cannot, not, not depend on just one platform. 
Um, yeah. And and you're you're an idiot if you do. And you will sooner or later you will learn the hard way. So just start build, diversifying your communication channels now, uh, and be mindful of what you say in public. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, seriously. We when I was teaching uh, college classes at university, there was quite a few in, people that were building influence, the, their influencer prowess, I guess on on Instagram. And I remember talking to them about that idea of like, hey, look, one day to the next, this could all change, you need to have, you know, you need to have multiple platforms where your message is being spread, because you never know. The fact of the matter is, is you're, you're playing a game that you have zero control over. Um, you know, you, well, I guess you have control over it until you don't, and you're not the one that determines when you don't have control over it anymore. So obviously, I mean, that's important to remember as a marketer, as a business person, um, to, to diversify, um, I am going to bring it back a little bit. So one of the things I find fascinating as I look at kind of the whole landscape of your career and what you've done is that you had these opportunistic moments that where your eyes were open, we talked about pulling back the curtain to technology, to the internet, to what that meant. And now, and you have, again, if you haven't read, if you're a digital marketer, if you're a marketer of any type, if you're in sales and you haven't uh, read the 80, 20 sales and marketing, the definitive guide to working less and making more, uh, as Josh said at the very top of the episode, he remembers right where he was when he read some of these principles that just made sense. And it was like, oh yeah, as an entrepreneur, as a business person, I'm struggling with some of this as a marketer, I'm struggling with some of this. So go read it. It's, it's, it's really, really good. But now you have a new book. It's a, it's a, it's a short read which I appreciated as I received it. Thank you for sending one out. Um, I'm sure you went to the post office and sent it out, stamped it and everything. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's the detox, declutter, dominate, how to excel by elimination. And some of the stuff in here as we, as we kind of wrap up on time, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but I want to ask some of the questions on the detox, declutter and dominate because you've watched, we said like, you didn't know what it was going to become, but you did see opportunity and you took, you know, you took advantage of that as an entrepreneur and you've been very successful in, in, internet business. And now we've seen this huge shift and it does tie into what we were just talking about where it's been in the news a lot lately of now we've got search engines and we've got social media and we've got news platforms online that are owned by, you know, people that own social media networks or that own, you know, all of these different ways that we're coming at it. And, and we're having, it's a conversation that as a parent, I have with my wife all the time about how are we going to raise our kids in this generation where we've got this phone that has, all, and who knows what that's going to evolve to. And I, I love some of the stuff in this book about the detox declutter and then how that leads to the dominate portion of things, which is success and growth. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how, you know, the first and some of the other interviews I watched and stuff where the first thing that people do anymore is reach when they wake up in the morning is reach over and grab their phone and start consuming. And the detox declutter part of this is critical, the minimalistic approach to starting your day and managing your life. So talk to me about this arc and what you've learned as you've seen the boom of the internet and then cell phones and social media and now how it's time to kind of pull back a little bit, recalibrate and how this book can help people do that and how some of the, you know, things you've, it's also co-written with Robert Scrop. Is it Scrop? Scrop. Yep. So all of these tools have their dark side. Okay. So, you know, we've, we've just talked about, Oh my goodness, the whole English language is for sale and I can advertise and, you know, and I mean, it's the coolest thing in the world, right? Yeah, I keep meaning to call attention to that because I've never heard it put that way, but it's true. Keyword, I mean, anything you do digital marketing, when you go and search or you tell Alexa, hey, search now or whatever, it's all, I mean, you're, the whole English language is on, is, is on sale. I, I never right. thought about it that way, but it makes so, sense. So the good news is <clears throat> the English language is for sale and everybody's attention is for sale. The bad news is the English language is for sale and everybody's attention is for sale. <laughs> okay. Double -edged. It's, it's always a double-edged sword. So it, it's not ironic at all that a pioneer in digital marketing would now be more focused on its excesses and its problems, frankly, than I am on the opportunities. So, so to give you an idea of what, uh, the book is about, or part of, well, just the first little bit of the book is, is about is how did I start my day uh, today? Well, I got out of bed and I journaled for about an hour. I pray, I meditate, I get myself centered. I figure out what questions I'm trying to answer for the day, what's going to be important. I, you know, I go in the shower, I have a brainstorm, I make sure I write it down. And then you know, that's like the first hour. And then after that, 
I'm spending my very best morning productive hours of the day, not reacting to stuff, not in my email box. I actually had some very important writing projects and I was just doing that. And I did not get interrupted by anybody. There's no phone calls, there's no emails, there's no social media, there's no CNN, there's no texting. And I was doing that until, I don't know, 10, 30 or 11 o'clock this morning an incredibly productive morning. You can have an imp incredibly productive morning every morning if you leave the reacting and the responding and the fires to put out until late morning or afternoon. And when you start your day in reactive mode, the whole thing just goes down the toilet and it goes down really fast. And then you're just catching up and you never, you never feel like you got enough done. You never really feel productive. And it's like 5.45 in the afternoon. You're like, what did I even do today? And, and that, if you fix that, then all of, all of the dominating and business stuff becomes much easier to do. Because here's the good news. Most of your competitors are addicted to their cell phone, addicted to social media, addicted to meaningless activity, addicted to $10 an hour work. They're ignoring the $1,000 an hour work. And if you have your head straight and your life and your brain is not run by other people, it's amazing what you can produce. Uh, those listeners that aren't watching this on YouTube, you are missing Josh's very big head nods up and down as Perry speaks. So now we're going to let Josh tell us why. <laughs> yeah, I've done this the wrong way for most of the past 20 years. So I know what doesn't work. <laughs> tell me about, Perry, the, the specifically, I'm calling Josh out on this. I'm calling myself out on this. I'm calling out a lot of people on this. The complaint about how there's not enough time. That is the most common. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm calling Josh out. Josh can call me out on it. We as business partners, it'll be like, hey, man, we need to get this done. I know, man, I just haven't had time. Or hey, I'm or an employee. Hey, what are we doing with this? Da, 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 da. I don't have enough time. Or my spouse or my friend or whatever. The, the biggest complaint I feel like I hear in, that mm -hmm. gets in the way of productivity is I don't, I, I don't have enough time. And I think sometimes it's a cop out. It's an easy thing to just put a lot of time. Um, but, but people really feel like they don't have enough time. How so we get ahead of that. So let's start by observing that being busy is a status symbol. For if sure. I'm too busy for you, then I'm better than you. Yeah. Okay. And that's a, that is a so true. And anybody that's ever sent an email and gotten the response, sorry, it's been super busy. It's a total power move. It's like, <laughs> I've got way too much going on. You know what I mean? I, I get it. Yeah, I really right. Okay. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that almost everybody is conditioned by elementary school, high school, college, jobs, um, getting paid by, per hour. Everybody is heavily conditioned to look busy. It's, yep. Starting with... Well, okay, class, I want you to write a thousand word report about the movie, okay, <laughs> right? Like, well, what does the number of words have to do with the quality of anything, right? How about like three really insightful sentences, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so um, people are conditioned to, to just do filler, one of, one of the th profound things that Richard Koch pointed out in his original 80-20 book was that he says, time is not scarce, time is plentiful. People just waste it. And he's right. <laughs> yeah, very, okay? very much so. There is plenty of time, okay? And I want you to think about this. Think about your bucket list. You know, bucket lists have all kinds of interesting things on them. Like, well, you know, I want to go to the Himalayas or I want to go to the Great Wall of China. And, and I, uh, well, I want to go visit Uncle Frank, um, you know, before he kicks the bucket. And I want to take my kids to Disneyland. And like, if, if you if you like really make the whole list, 
I bet you there's at least two things on that list that you could do this month if you just decided to. <laughs> okay. It's like, why aren't you doing them? Right. Now, if you really understand 80 20, and if you understand what it says about your time, 80 20 says that 50% of your productivity comes from 1% of your time. So let's say that you work on straight commission or you're an entrepreneur and you eat what you kill, in 2020, you made half of your income in five days or less. And it might have been four hours on April 19 and two days in June and uh, a meeting you had in September and this other speaking engagement you had in November. And that was like where all the clients came from or all the deals came through and most of the rest of the year was just sawdust. And if you carefully look at how everything went together, that's almost certainly the case. But people don't realize it. This whole thing, four hour work week, Tim Ferriss, right? Became incredibly popular for, and I remember reading that book and, and being like, oh man, the, this idea, work four hours a week and make all this money, whatever. I, I get it. And I get the, but what's the end goal? I mean, and when is enough enough? I mean, what, so is, is, is truly the goal to just say, you know, I'm going to manage my time so well that again, and I know this is an extreme version of it, but I'm only going to work five days a week and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, or sorry, five days a year, because that's my most productive days. And then what do you do with the rest of the time? I mean, where does the balance come from? And when is enough enough? Well, okay. So, so first of all, is, as soon as you become aware that your time is not equal, there's $10 an hour work, $100 an hour work, $1,000, $10,000 an hour work, literally. Um, it, and and I, I talk about that in the detox book and I prove it to you. Even Helen, the receptionist at the dentist office, has these little bursts of two-minute, $100,000-an-hour work. It might only last for 30 seconds or two minutes, but it's there. First, you become aware of it, okay? Now, and then you figure out there's a bunch of stuff that I shouldn't be doing. But the other thing that happens is you start to become aware that I actually need to engineer space into my life just for exploration, just to make sure that I have time to go have lunch with the friend of a friend who one time in 20 or one time in 50 could end up being hugely significant in your life, but you have no way of knowing. Instead of just doing barnacle routines, of predictable, somewhat obsessive, compulsive, low-level activity that just makes you feel like you're looking busy. And then and it's because people fill their lives with so much trivia that all of a sudden their brother gets killed in a car accident and they're like, I hadn't even seen him in a year. Why didn't I go see my brother? Because you were scrolling through Facebook, dude, right? It's like, what's actually important to you? And, and, and like, people just have to snap out of it, like, jerk your head out of the matrix. Yeah, because it, um, it sounds easy enough. And when you, when you put it that way, it's like, oh, yeah, obviously. I mean, and, and that's the thing is we're very self-aware. I think what we've done, and I actually told my, I keep bringing up my wife and kids on this episode, but. I, um, I, I, we were talking the other day and I said, you know, we're fortunate, fortunate to be raising our kids in an era where we're at least self-aware of the pros and cons of, and we'll become more and more self-aware, but the pros and cons of technology and screens and all of this stuff, right. And the addictive tendencies that are developing as a result of social media and stuff. So, um, you know, I brought that up and we, we had that conversation, but that being said, my wife and I are guilty as anybody as, oh, I'm sitting on the couch and, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Or she's like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm just flipping through Reddit or Facebook or Instagram aimlessly. I don't even think about it. And everybody that's listening to this that has a smartphone knows that moment when you're like, oh, yeah, I have no idea why I'm looking at the whatever. Right? right. So so it sounds really easy to say, oh, well, I'm just going to break it. I'm just going to stop. But the fact is, is we're addicted and mm -hmm. it is a tendency that is that requires you know, diligence to break these habits. 
So what, how, how do we snap out of it? What are, what are the steps to, to take? I mean, obviously stop doing it, but, but if, if you were to break it down and, and this book, you know, where the people can get, what, what, what's the, what are the ideas that help you pull out of that and start to really maximize your time and become more meaningful and intentional? I think that's the big thing is like, it's living with intention, right? Well, so the, the, the quality focus time in the morning, I call it Renaissance time. And I say, I say it's mandatory. If you're going to keep your sanity, you need at least 20 minutes after you get up in the morning where it's, you're not on a computer, you're not on a cell phone, you get your own thoughts, you can think, you can pray, you can meditate, you can you know, write down the, the idea that you had in the shower and you get yourself sorted out. I had a, uh, I had a client who and his wife, they came, they had just had a baby and they're nursing and all this crazy stuff is going on. And he said to me, he said, look, you know, we've, we've got the baby crying all night. We got all this stuff going on. And he said, if I manage to do my Renaissance time anyway, my day is great. He said, if I skip my Renaissance time, my whole day goes to shit. Well, if you can get that straight, that that's pretty much how it works and, and make it sacred. See, this is a gift to yourself. I mean, I say it's mandatory. Obviously, I can't make you do it. But it's like, no, like I'm going to give myself this gift. So that's kind of like at the beginning of the day. And then, it, and then at the end of the day, in the lower quality, see, I think, so here's an analogy. Here's how I think most people work. Most people, they'll, they'll use their chainsaw until the chainsaw runs out of gas. And for most people, the chainsaw runs out of gas at about 1130 in the morning. Uh, usually by then, you've already done your best work and your best thinking, and you've already been in your best headspace. And then you start, you know, then it's lunch and you start to get tired. So what people do is after their chainsaw runs out of gas, then they chop with an ax and, they, and then they, 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 they chop and chop the tree. And then like about 530 in the afternoon, their ax is so dull that it won't cut anymore. And then they go get a saw and then they start sawing the tree. And then they saw the tree until 11 o'clock at night. Well, how about, you just do three hours of chainsaw instead of one hour of chainsaw. And this is, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Yeah. We've had a lot more trees down um, with, with a chainsaw. And like when you run out of energy, go do something fun and interesting. Don't keep cramming it with more stuff that makes you look busy. And that's a com as simple as that sounds, that is a complete 180 yeah. way most people think about work. It is. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you put it, uh, um, where, where, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We are, um, developed or whatever. I can't think of the word right now to be, to be busy, to, to put in a nine hour, five hour day condition. Yeah. This is the word I was looking for. Um, there's also a lot of outside pressure and stigma to look that way. Right. So whether it's to your spouse or to your, coworkers or to your whatever, right? Like there's just like, Oh, I got to I got to put in my hours. I got to get the work done. And so I think that's a hard thing to break as well is to say, no, I don't have, I, I, I'm going to be productive for four hours and then I'm going to do X, Y, and Z with the rest of my time. And there's kind of an interesting pressure for a lot of people to, well, no, that's not the normal way to do it. And if you do that, you're not, you know, you're not successful. And obviously there's people out there that are breaking that norm and proving that that's, that's the case, but it is interesting to see the kind of outside pressure that is, is tied and the stigma that's tied to, you know, this type of paradigm shift. People feel very guilty if they're not looking busy. If, if like before COVID anyway, I had cleaning ladies uh, that would come over to our house every week. And like, I had to have a conversation with myself. It's okay. If you're sitting on the couch, reading a magazine and the cleaning ladies are vacuuming around your feet, Yeah, that is perfectly Okay. You're doing what you want to do, and they are doing what you're paying them to do, and you are not obligated to be doing the same thing they're doing. Okay, and 
or, or like one time I had a client, he spent a ton of money and he came and he spent a day. I mean, my fees aren't cheap. Well, he, he got the insight he was looking for at 1130 in the morning and at 1.30 in the afternoon, he just left. Uh, he could have had the whole rest of the day until 5. My wife goes, well, Perry, what are you going to do? And I go, I don't know. I guess I got some. St-. She goes, no, no. Take the day off, Perry. Like, go ride your bike. Like, the client took the day off. Like, you take the day off, too. And that was one of the most memorable afternoons I've had in, uh, you know, in the last few years because, uh, it, like people think that it's not okay to do that. Look, when if if you did what you're supposed to do, then you can go do something fun and you can go explore and you can go. I have all kinds of fascinating projects. Josh knows about some of them. Uh, that's like a whole nother conversation um, that are really really fascinating, and I have permission to do them because it's part of how I grow. Well, this is all so insightful and getting, you know, getting an hour to pick your brain and hear about everything you've, you've worked on over your career is, is something we're really grateful for right, right now. There's a number of stuff. So obviously again, the book is detox, declutter, dominate, how to excel by elimination. Um, can you can just go on Amazon and and get that and your your website, perrymarshall.com. Yeah. If you go to perrymarshall.com, um, I would, if you enjoyed today, Go to perrymarshall.com, scroll down. There's a link to sign up for the 30-day street MBA, and uh, you'll get punched in the face on the very first day, I promise. (laughs) Yeah, and it's really, again, short, sweet, simple, but just kind of one of those really dense, every sentence, every paragraph is very, very meaningful, and and you can take a lot out of it. So definitely, I mean, it'll take you... 36 pages. It's yeah. Incredible. Hour and you're through it and you'll, and then go back through it again and again and again, where else right now, I know you've got a lot of things that you're working on. Like you said, what are some of those things that you're most interested in kind of sharing right now or, or what, where, where can people find you and see what you're continuing to work on? Well, if, if you, if you go to evo2.org, evo number org, I've got a whole project called evolution 2.0 where there I've got the largest, science prize in the world. I've got, um, $10 million, $10 million. Um, I've got a, a whole project called cancer and evolution, uh, where we're, we're combining evolutionary biology with oncology with some of the world's smartest scientists. And that's a incredibly fascinating project. Um, and, uh, and, and so anyway, I, I eat my own dog food. I, I live what I preach and, you know, I work hard, but I work smart and I work on other interesting things and I do fun things and life doesn't have to be drudgery. Life can be really great. And even in a world of political correctness and censorship and everything else, you can have an audience that listens to you and, um, cuts against the grain and does contrarian things. And life is amazing. Cool. Well, we appreciate your time. I, uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to follow on your journey. I uh, remind me to connect you with Ben Korn, who, if you go to our podcast and listen, I think, I think his episode went live. So we had an episode go live today, but last week, his name is Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin Korn. He's an oncologist. Yeah, oh. we ta- we we started talking about it towards the end, but we're actually doing a second part of his episode because he spent the last ten or fifteen years studying the biology and the science behind hope in oncology and and mm-hmm. how he's creating systems and processes and doing a ton of research on how implementing different hope strategies into wow. um, these cancer patients, how it prolongs their life and helps them in tremendous ways. But he's he's somebody you should connect with on that that oncology project on the cancer research. He's awesome. That's outstanding. Well, thank you, Corey. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Perry. We will definitely, uh, we'll definitely be in touch. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, Perry. Thank you. Take care. Bye.